I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. In for Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Now, coming up in the next hour, another week of trade talks. While both the China and the US says progress was made, it could be weeks until a final agreement is made. Plus, Regulation Nation, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg released his outline for regulating the web, but some within Washington are not convinced. We'll speak with FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. And IP, oh no, Blue Apron saw massive gains this week, but it still serves as a cautionary tale for tech IPOs, losing 90% of its market value since going public. But first, to our top story. It's a busy week of trade talks in Washington, and yet still no final trade deal to speak of. One that President Trump, after meeting with Chinese Vice Premier on Thursday, described with some flair. We've never done a deal like this with China, uh, and uh, it's very unique set of circumstances, but it's a massive deal. Could be one of the, I guess it is, if you think about it, the biggest deal ever made. There can't be a deal like this. No matter where you look, there can't be a deal like this. This is, uh, this is the granddaddy of them all. A granddaddy deal that the president added that could be announced within four weeks. But on Friday, he then dialed it back a bit. We're going to see. I don't want to predict a deal or not a deal, but we're very well along. We've really negotiated probably the two hardest points very successfully for our country. To discuss in Washington is Bloomberg Sarah McGregor, who leads our U.S. economic policy coverage. And with me in the studio is Isaac Stonefish, senior fellow at the Asia Society. Let's start with you, Sarah, because initially it was going to be four weeks, maybe six. But overall, the stumbling blocks always seem to be the same, IP, tariffs and enforcement. Yes, I think, you know, President Donald Trump has sort of raised hopes even higher as of yesterday that he's really going to get, as he called it, a monumental deal, the granddaddy of all deals. And I think, you know, if there was any doubt if the U.S. would maybe sort of go a little weak in the knees and go for a deal that didn't include some of these hardline issues, it, it's going to be now um, sort of wiped out. I think that the Trump administration needs to come back within, you know, Trump's timeline, four weeks, perhaps six weeks by the time they get it all on paper, and come back with something that really goes hard on China's intellectual property practices, commits China to purchases, and what the Trump administration really wants makes it enforceable, which means if China doesn't live up to those commitments, the U.S. can hit back perhaps with higher tariffs or some sort of, some sort of automatic way to uh, punish China. Mm. I, Isaac, from your perspective, it's interesting that I've been watching the markets all day and relative optimism what's come out of U.S. and China. I'm looking at a chart that shows how U.S. trade policy uncertainty, however it is measured, particularly in the press, seems to have come down a fair bit. Hmm. Do you think that's right? Do you think this optimism is to be believed? I think the optimism that a deal will be reached is to be believed. I think the question of whether or not this deal will actually deal with what U.S. businesses want with regards to China is much more of an open question. Hmm. What Trump wants is a win and to reduce the trade deficit. But what American businesses want is a more level playing field. They want to be treated fairly in China. They don't want to have to worry about IP theft. They don't have to be worried about giving their technology to Chinese firms. And these are not issues that are front burner issues for Trump, who just wants this magical trade deficit number to go down. Are they front burner issues, Sarah, for Lighthizer? Because he's the key negotiator here. He's always been the China hawk. And we have heard a lot more lip service paid to, well, certainly the IP, the, the companies that maybe a US venture has within China, they would have full ownership. They wouldn't have to have some sort of joint venture in China. They could, they could go in there purely on their own. Yes, we have heard from our sources that parts of the agreement would commit China to open up to a, a full ownership, at least for some industries, um, for foreign companies, U.S. companies who wanted to operate there instead of joint ventures, commit them to a certain amount of purchases by 2025. And it would sort of, those purchases would be front-loaded ahead of Trump's election bid. So there is probably, um, you know, a political motive in play. But as you said, you know, Lighthizer is, is here for sort of the end game. He would like to see a deal that is fulsome. And he, he was the one yesterday when uh, President Trump met with Liu He, Chinese negotiator. It, Lighthizer was the one who said there's a lot more work to be done. Mm. So I think he offered that dose of reality. Uh, dose of reality also, though, coming to China, 
Isaac, when you're looking at the trade numbers, you were saying that you know everyone kind of wants a deal done. Trump does too. But certainly China, when you're looking at the trade measures, I'm looking at the GTV library and showing how much imports, exports have been falling in negative territory. We're seeing the monthly trade balance really coming down. They're hurting. From a power perspective, do you think some of the will of US corporates that you were mentioning that they want to see go over the line, the IP, the those elements could be done with China because of the pressure on their economy? I think that U.S. corporates are still going to be really focused on these issues, especially privately. I think publicly they might try to be in line with what they feel the U.S. government wants, and especially in this case what they feel what the Chinese government wants. But I don't think this is going to change the fundamentals there. And um, what would then? What would change that? I, I think either some sort of we're not right now in a crisis in U.S.-China relations. I think we could easily get there. I don't think we're that far away. I think a, a real push that made trade with China radioactive, in a way, that could change the way the U.S. feels about it. Or, alternatively, actual concrete steps that make U.S. businesses feel that China is actually listening and changing and being more open to their concerns. Because a lot of things that U.S. businesses want do benefit China as well level playing field, rule of law, you know, actual ways for them to invest and benefit China. This could be, I hate to use the phrase win-win because -win, it's so used in these situations, but this could be a situation that really benefits both sides. Sarah, what are the uh, lobbying elements that you're hearing about? Because, of course, we've set, seen many a time Ms. Tim Cook or Tim Apple, as he might be referred to by the President Trump, coming along that been, clearly had the ear of Washington to a certain extent. And these are companies that are affected by supply chains with China, would be hugely impacted if, if tensions were to ramp up any further. Absolutely. Companies like Apple lobbied to have, um, you know, their items left off the list of, of ones that would have tariffs placed on them, or at least their supply chains have tariffs placed on them. So there is a huge um, emphasis right now from the business community. I think, you know, getting a quick solution to the trade war, as long as a solution to the trade war would be important for a lot of companies. This uncertainty that's hanging over companies right now is huge, and it's preventing them from making the investment decisions that they want to make, that those are being delayed, or whether they're going to create new jobs, because there's just, there's no real um, sort of total slam dunk outcome that anyone can hold those, those two. So I think having an end to this, another four to six weeks might not seem that long, but if this drags on much longer, I think there could be, um, you know, business could start to agitate a little bit more. Great perspective coming from Sam McGregor. We love having you on. And Isaac Stonefish of the Asia Society, thank you for your expertise here. Now let's talk Tesla, because the board conducted a probe into allegations that CEO Elon Musk pushed an employee. Now that's according to a statement issued to Bloomberg by the company's directors, who concluded there was, quote, no physical altercation between the two. But sources have told Bloomberg Musk did make physical contact with a staff member. Joining us to discuss this rather touchy subject is Bloomberg's Craig Trudell in New York, who leads our automotive coverage. It's an interesting story and one that you say that actually Dana Hall and Eric Newcomer have been taking a while to report out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really, this is uh, putting aside all the details of what happened. This is uh, what the significance of this story is. It's another uh, instance in which this this board has had to sort of answer for Musk's conduct. So I think that's the real sort of important context here. Uh, but the the incident itself, it took place in September of last year. It was a month after the uh, sort of now infamous uh, funding secured take private tweets. So a stressful time. It was a very it. stressful time. He was having to defend himself against that. Uh, obviously, that take private effort all sort of fell apart within a few weeks. He was losing executives left and right. And this particular executive that is sort of the subject of this story uh, was on his way out from the company uh, and, and uh, was sort of physically accosted by Musk on his, on his way out. Uh, he was, he was uh, touched on his way out, we're told, and also just followed on, on his way out of the parking lot. There was sort of a, a verbal altercation that took place as well. And so is that why it got elevated? Because it's, it doesn't seem too disastrous an, an impact, but to, to have reached board level means that something really significant must have happened here, or it must have affected enough employees to deem worrying, right? Right, and, and what, what got the board involved was actually a, a, a 
this being flagged to the human resources department of the company. So uh, obviously at that time, it was before Elon Musk had been ousted as chairman uh, of, of the board. Uh, he remains on, on the board, but uh, in order for this to be investigated, uh, you would you would sort of uh, sort of gather that you would have to to bring in uh, you know an investigation that the board itself uh, is involved with because the the human resources department is reporting up to a guy who not only is the CEO but the chairman and really is sort of the face of the company. So that's what we've we've learned over the last uh, over the course of reporting this story. And of course, this reminds us of just sort of the stress that Elon Musk puts his lips himself under like sleeping at the Fremont available uh, saying he was in production hell so we can see the tension that he was under it's got to be said yeah and it, it just begs more questions about whether this is uh, a reason that this guy is having so much trouble retaining some of his top employees uh, one of the things that we've noticed too is that he's uh, had trouble maybe bringing in uh, sort of bigger name hires from outside of Tesla where uh, you were able to see a little bit more of that in the past of of uh, you know the, this being a company that could recruit from outside, uh, and now that this is a company that's having trouble with production, having trouble uh, now with deliveries, uh, you know they, he he needs all the help that he can get, and this may be sort of a, a an example of why he's maybe struggling to get that help. And certainly trouble with the SEC, not to mention plenty. So quite a torrid week for Elon Musk, and it seems as though the reporting continues. Great to get your analysis of it. We thank you, Bloomberg's Craig Trudell there. Now coming up, Mark Zuckerberg wants the government to save Facebook and other big tech companies from themselves, apparently. Our next guest says that's not happening. We'll speak with the SEC Commissioner Brendan Carr shortly. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio, why don't you? You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and of course, in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Now, some more troubling news for Facebook. The social network housed dozens of cyber criminal groups who use the platform to illegally sell things like stolen credit card information. That's all according to researchers at Cisco. 74 pages of these online marketplaces contained over 380,000 members and were apparently quite easy to locate as long as you have a Facebook account. Now, Facebook has said it removed the groups, some of which are at least eight years old. And of course, last weekend, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg laid out his four-point plan calling for global regulation of the internet. Now, among the responses to his op-ed, one government official voiced his opposition, FCC Commissioner Brandon Carr. He tweeted, Facebook says it's taking heat for the mistakes it makes in moderating content, so it calls for the government to police our speech for it. Outsourcing censorship to the government is not just a bad idea, it would violate the First Amendment. I'm a no. Commissioner Carr joins us now from Washington. Break it down for us, Mr. Carr, exactly what your problem is. Yeah, so as you pointed out, I think, in the earlier segment, Facebook has been under pressure for a lot of missteps recently. One area in particular has been the mistakes that it's been making with respect to moderating online content, with the decisions that it chooses to make about what can be said on its platform. And I think calling in the government as a response to that pressure and asking the government to police our online speech for it, that's just not a bad idea. Uh, that's a violation of the First Amendment. But interestingly, in some ways, there's this tension, particularly within the party that you come from, Republican. Ted Cruz, in many ways, wants to see more regulation of Facebook, doesn't like, in some ways, wants these companies to be held accountable. But then on the other side of it, there's some calls and concerns from Republican lawmakers that there's some bias built into social media companies such as Facebook. How do you think regulation should or shouldn't, therefore, be enacted in general? Well, I think the regulation that Facebook is calling for in this circumstance, it's not asking for help policing either illegal content or to go after unlawful activity. What it says in this op-ed is that the government should step in and start regulating what it calls uh, harmful content. Now, how do you define harmful content? Mm -hmm. Well, Facebook wants politicians to step in and start making those decisions. And you can think around the world, there's plenty of government regimes that would accept the invitation to silence political speech to shut down ideas that they don't like based on the mantle of it being harmful content. I see. So there's an element that the free speech I can see is something that you're concerned about protecting. However, should 
Facebook in general be regulated? Should there be some in form of regulation for the other areas of content that Facebook's looking at in, in respect of looking across the pond to GDPR in Europe? Well, I think it's interesting that Facebook waited until after it obtained a dominant position, until after it was about a half a trillion dollar in market cap to start calling for heavy-handed government regulation, whether on the speech front or on the GDPR front, as you pointed out. In my time as a regulator in D.C., I can tell you large corporations don't call for greater government control as an act of charity. It makes it that much harder for competitors and for startups to compete in the space. Heavy-handed regulation sets up an economic moat uh, and can be used to protect business models. And I think we always want to see more competition. Okay, so how can you foster that without regulation coming from the government? Well, government regulation only makes it more difficult for competitors to enter this space. There's all kinds of actions that Facebook could take uh, with its algorithms and otherwise to act in a neutral manner, an unbiased manner, if the goal here is to get at uh, unlawful activity. One of the things that was called for, though, in this piece was for the government to start regulating uh, what Zuckerberg called divisive political speech. And he cited in particular speech on issues like immigration. And I think we have a long tradition in this country of wanting to foster discussions on hot button issues and not have the government step in and shut it down. So I think it's this marriage of big tech and big government uh, that presents a pretty scary outlook if we were to go down that path. What then about, from the other side of the aisle, has been discussed, as I mentioned, Ted Cruz in some ways agreeing with Elizabeth Warren about breaking up such large companies. You have said previously that, you know, now Facebook has reached such a scale, some would call it an oligopoly in some way, maybe a monopoly. But what would you say, do, do these companies need to start to be looking, looked at and split up, or is that something you're against? Well, I've seen calls from people like Senator Warren that are looking to break up big tech, and that's not what I'm advocating for. I think in a lot of ways this is a reaction to those calls in its attempt to distract, whether it's just to pass the buck generally or to move attention off of those calls to break up big tech. But my main position is we shouldn't be sacrificing the First Amendment or offering it up to the government as tribute to distract from calls for broader reform. There is an element, though, that harmful content is just one element of regulation that Mark Zuckerberg was talking about. He had three other key proposals, election integrity, privacy, data portability. The suggestions he had there, how did you react to them? Yeah, not very favorably. So you take the one on elections. One of the ideas he had there was that there's this very narrow category of speech that Americans have been willing to accept heavy regulation on, which is campaign ads. Uh, right around an election. And the idea that he put forward is that instead of limiting that regulation to campaign ads, we should extend that heavy handed regulation to discussions of all hot button issues outside of campaigns. Uh, I think that's a very dangerous precedent. We want to be encouraging discussion about immigration and other hot button issues that the proposal would subject to government regulation. And going forward, is there anywhere that you could see any changes done internally by Facebook that you don't think needs regulation that could aid the way in which we see harmful content reach the public discourse? Like, how would you like the company to self-regulate if you don't want to see overall regulation being enforced by government? Yeah, I think Facebook can fix Facebook. We don't need to get the government involved and to start stepping on First Amendment rights to do it. I think there's a lot of neutral, unbiased steps that can be taken to get there. Uh, my point is we simply don't need to bring the government in and have it start regulating online content as a way to solve whatever problems Facebook thinks it's facing. Okay, we loved having your perspective on today. We thank you, FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. We thank you for joining us. Coming up, staff unrest has once again forced Google's hand. Why the company is scrapping a controversial council soon after it was formed. This is Bloomberg. Google's AI Ethics Council was created and disbanded all over the course of little more than one week after a dramatic outcry over who appointed to serve on the panel. In a statement, Google said, quote, we're ending the council and going back to the drawing board. We'll continue to be responsible in our work on the important issues that AI raises and we'll find different ways of getting outside opinions on these topics. 
Bloomberg Technologies Mark Bergen covers Alphabet and joins us from San Francisco. And Mark, talk us through what the backlash was really about. The people on the board? You know, I think the backlash is fundamentally about uh, Google's problem they've had for at least the past year uh, of this uh, dissent inside the company um, around issues around, around AI, ethics, um, their new cl cloud division. Um, so the main issue was the appointment of the, the president of the Heritage Foundation, which was a conservative think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, there were several vocal people inside, the, inside Google um, that started a petition that said that they thought that her positions on um, transgender issue and climate change were not reflective of, of the company and, and not the right per advocate and person to be on this outside committee. Um, one, another committee member um, actually declined the invitation days after. You saw a lot of back and forth on Twitter and, uh, from people in the AI ethics world. It just, it just sort of immediately was a, a backlash that Google just did, did not seem prepared for. And what had sparked them wanting to make the Ethics Council to begin with? It's interesting in the UK, I've, I've seen the government reach to the founders of DeepMind, for example, which Google now owns, to be able to debate the ethics of AI going forward. Is it the same sort of thoughts of how to get ahead of the curve in the debate? Yeah, I mean, Google's been talking about this for a, for a long time, and DeepMind's a very good example. Right when DeepMind was formed, they said they would they would start an outside council uh, to sort of hold the responsibility of, of their artificial intelligence. Uh, there were some jokes that this was that they were building AI that was so powerful that they needed uh, to put uh, guardrails in place. But there have been these, these conversations at Google and other companies about putting ethical lines. And, and to your point, you know, there's some people that saying this is, this is basically their way of getting ahead of, of any potential regulation. Uh, Google's last year, their, their set of AI principles that you know, there were kind of a list of seven topics that they said. And when we, when we use AI, the company, um, we're going to be thinking about this. And that that was prompted by their um, contract with the military in Project Maven, mm. and that was another uh, employee revolt, as you remember, that actually caused them to back out of that, that contract. So they're they're trying to put in place basically parameters where they can satisfy their their, their engineers, who are very important to them, but continue to get um, contracts with with governments and with companies as they move into into cloud computing, which is of course their biggest uh, area of growth outside of their their core business. And this seems to become. A a growing problem for Google and the parent alphabet of being able to get ahead of really have their own very large employee base is thinking. Uh, it has been, especially the past few years. I mean, I talked to a lot of employees that they would say that there's a market shift from the Google of the past, which was the sort of ethos was there would be fully transparent inside. So you can talk about anything and debate anything ad nauseum inside the company, um, but at least have a kind of a collective front. And, and Google has for years had this culture where they have open dialogue and discord and open disagreements. I think there's a few things changed, certainly the political climate here. Um, you talk to a lot of employees that are not the senior, um, and they talk about a lack of transparency to the company, and that's a fundamental issue is that, that Google can't solve. Mark Bergen, always great to get your analysis on the company that you cover throughout so well. We thank you. Coming up now, after much fanfare, Lyft is struggling to trade above its listing price, but it's just the latest of many large IPOs to disappoint in recent years. We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York, and we have some new details ahead of Uber's anticipated IPO. Morgan Stanley will oversee Uber's stock in the first hours of its trading debut. Now, the job of stabilization agent is a coveted one because it carries potential for more commissions on trades. Morgan Stanley also helped Uber write the prospectus, which should be publicly filed this month. However, the overall IPO landscape hasn't been quite so rosy. Earlier this week, Lyft traded below its listing price of $72 per share, and a Bloomberg Business Week covered the cautionary tale for unicorn IPO investors. Looking back on Blue Apron's performance, its stock tumbled nearly 90% since its 2017 IPO. Joining us now is the writer of that very piece, Bloomberg's cross-asset reporter Sarah Ponzak, and in Seattle, please say Tony Scherer with Smead Capital Management, Director of Research, joins us. So, Sarah, start with you. Great piece. And remind us of really what the failings were of Blue Apron that now can be perhaps translated to Lyft, Uber, some of the other non-profit making companies. So what's interesting about Blue Apron, obviously you look at the business models and what they are actually doing. Yes, meal kit delivery service, very different <laughs> from the likes of ride sharing. However, when investors largely thought of Blue Apron, it was seen as a high growth company with a lot of large growth prospects, many looped it in with tech 
because it was a disruptor and that's really what it has in common with the likes of Lyft or Uber or some of the other names coming out this year. It's the fact that they are disruptors. They are very different. However, you look at Blue Apron and what happened now down 90% since it IPO'd, it trades at a dollar and you have to ask yourself, could it be possible that some of these other companies out have similar issues and can't capitalize on what they are saying they are going to do going forwards. And Tony, to a certain extent, which Sarah's piece encapsulates so well, is that we live in bubbles nowadays. And yes, the idea of a delivery to your home costing $23 to make your own meal within 30 minutes seems like a great idea on the East Coast and the West Coast. But in Central America and generally in the middle of many countries, these sort of rather luxurious ideas don't always carry weight. No, you're exactly right. And I, you know, I think when Blue Apron came out and the red herring, they were talking about how they thought they could address 99% of the U.S. population with their ready-made meals. And I think what they forgot is that a lot of America, they have a Blue Apron or a Chef Hat, and they make really uh, very good homemade meals without that uh, <laughs> having to happen. So, uh, you know, it's just their total addressable market, like they would talk about, was drastically overstated, right? Yeah, it's interesting, Sarah. I look back to the European version, mm -hmm. uh, HelloFresh, and actually that company has managed to support its valuation much better. It's about 1.3 billion euros. Yes, uh, n not the $3 billion that Blue Apron had gone for, but certainly not the sell-off that we've seen there. So some, maybe Blue Apron in particular was mm -hmm. a particular victim of competition here. But what about just the idea of trying to invest in non-profitable companies in general and this desire, this lust for, for growth right now? Well, there is really a desire for lust right now. You look in the public markets and you can see it immensely this year, especially with the idea of slower growth, so uh, lower interest rates. Mm. And right now investors are really reaching for it. And you look at Lyft, it's not a profitable company. You look at Uber, it's not a profitable company. There are many of these unicorns that are going to come out, but don't necessarily make money just yet. So investors have to come up with some type of way to value the company. And now it seems like some that are learning that it might take a little bit longer for these companies to turn a profit than initially expected, but it's really difficult to find a proper way to really value these companies and pinpoint it down because a lot of it is a guessing game or holding these companies to their word that they are going to do what they said, just as was mentioned, like Blue Apron saying they are going to eventually get in the hands of 99% of Americans. Tony, in some ways, are uh, the views and needs of Wall Street align to the future investor base? It, it, in many ways, no. Uh, the other thing they lust after is disruptive innovation. I think you already mentioned th those words. And you know, ultimately there's really nothing all that disruptive about, how, uh, about eating a meal. Um, having a good app to be able to interact with that is new and kind of innovative, but the market capitalization that gets ascribed to this disruptive idea has been way overcapitalized and misallocated to. And why is that, do you think? I mean, it's interesting that many of these IPOs are coming to fruition when these companies are quite old, they're about a decade old, but in many ways you make the point that it's not just the companies that need to exit, need that liquidity moment to feed back into the people that have been working with them for so long, but it's also Wall Street needs these IPOs to get out. I think you already mentioned uh, Morgan Stanley did the first uh, junk bond debt offering uh, to underwrite uh, Uber. In 2016, they're going to be the lead uh, uh, organizer of the stock in the first few hours that it trades right now. And Goldman Sachs, many of the executive on Uber's board right now and, and in the C-suite are former Goldman Sachs people. And by the way, a lot of Goldman high net worth and ultra high net worth investors own this thing. So there's a lot of vested interest in this thing doing well and getting out the door and getting off the ground. And right now they've got a open window on the IPO front to do just that. But Sarah, to the flip side, you know, to all the cynics out there, there is also the lesson that we've learned with Amazon, that sometimes you can have a phenomenal disruptor that does incredibly well and mm -hmm. eventually does hand you profit. And some are also looking, take Facebook, for example. Facebook did not have a good year after it IPO'd, yet look at it now. It really took off clearly and has monetized itself very well. But at the same time, some people are looking at Lyft and saying, well, we have struggled to trade above the IPO price of $72 this week. Today we closed above it, but 
we can't really know for sure in a week. We're going to yeah. have to see what this appetite is really like as we see more of these companies come to market, particularly Uber, which could come as soon as this month. So it's difficult to take the likes of Snapchat, or Blue Apron or a week's trading of Lyft and completely extrapolate it across the broad ecosystem. There could be differences there, but there are similarities. There are similarities, but it's also worth remembering that the five most valuable companies on the S&P <laughs> 500 are all technology. Mm -hmm. Always great to get your perspective. Of course, Tony Scherer in Smead Capital Management. And I'm pleased to say Sarah Ponsak's going to be sticking with me in New York because I want to cover another one of her key stories. She's been a busy lady. Yes. Time for millennials to stand aside Side. Make way for Generation Z, or Z as I might say. This year, Gen Z replaces millennials as the biggest consumer cohort globally, becoming a new obsession for investors and looks like it comes down to well, kind of three things, marijuana, social justice, and Kylie Jenner. Sarah, talk us through your great, incredibly readable piece. Thank you. It all started because you started to think up ways of being able to encapsulate investing in Gen Z. Right, this was a really fun one and the way I got involved was pretty interesting. So I cover ETFs, I came up with this hypothetical fund that was the Influencer Economy ETF and the ticker was Gen Z and in the past Trillions podcast which is the weekly ETF podcast here, we had a bit of a competition to see who could come up with the best idea. And this is what I came up with and the way it works was that you look at the top 20 influencers that are ranked by Forbes and it really takes into account how many followers they have mm -hmm. on social media accounts like Instagram and looks at the companies that they partner with. So you think of Cristiano Ronaldo, you think of Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, The Rock. Celebrities like these, they really have an influence on what Gen Z is doing. And you mentioned Kylie Jenner, for example. She is the perfect example. She has a partnership with Ulta because she sells her beauty line in the company. Just take Ulta, for example. Yeah. The line went over last year. It's up 40% since. And therefore, the, the theoretical ETF that you designed has significantly outperformed. You also include right. companies like Adidas, which just mm -hmm. this week we saw sign Beyonce, another key influencer. What is it that motivates, what's different about Gen Z than say you or I that like to deem ourselves millennials? You much more can, I'm, or, <laughs> I'm just about in there. Well, I'm kind of just about in there, I know. <laughs> but, but when you think about Gen Z, they grew up on this. I mean, the entire time, they're age seven to 22, that they've really been around, so too has the likes of Amazon or much of their lives, Instagram, Snapchat. So this is embedded in their lives. They know nothing other than it. Mm. So they are so influenced by everything they see. Bloomberg did a survey with the help of Morning Consult and they found that 52% of Gen Z actually do say that they find out about new products on Instagram. That's really the mode that they find out about these products and it influences their spending habits. That's more than millennials, that's mm. more than Gen X. So you see this change and a lot of it really does come just because it's not just they have exposure to the internet, they have exposure to these new companies that have not been around for too, too long. So it's not actually going long the social media platforms that they access, it's going long the companies that they can access through social media. Right. So it's going long Adidas, going long Nike, but also going long cannabis stocks, right? Yeah, so also in the survey they found that Gen Z is actually twice as likely to use cannabis than the national average. Cannabis or CBD? Uh, cannabis and CBD. Not much as not as much CBD. CBD seems to be catering to the older generations, okay. uh, but cannabis and weed. So you look at these numbers, and they are also shunning beer. They're shunning alcohol. They don't want to wake up feeling bloated. They feel like weed and cannabis is a way around that. So you can think of companies like. Aurora, Canopy Growth, that's ways to get into that, but also kind of on that front, shifting over a bit, but in the food arena as well, a lot mm. of Gen Z are vegans or vegetarians or pescatarians, even more so than millennials. So when you think of these large packaged goods companies yeah. or the big fast food companies, they're going to have to really think about strategy as this age gets even older because they're going to have to keep them attracted. Fascinating when we just be thinking of Burger King introducing the Impossible Burger and Nestle bringing right. out their own one. It's a very on-trend story. Thank you. We like it. Very Thank on you very much indeed. <laughs> Sarah Ponzak bringing us all things Gen Z. Coming up.
mattress brand Casper has achieved unicorn status with a $100 million fresh capital raise. How the direct-to-consumer brand plans to use the new investment, that's next. This is Bloomberg. Online mattress startup Casper has joined the Unicorn Club. The company recently secured $100 million in new funding, bringing its valuation to more than a billion. Casper is part of a growing class of startups selling directly to consumers online. And now it's looking to expand its bricks and mortar business. In the latest edition of Retail Transformed, Bloomberg's Selena Wang spoke with Casper CEO Philip Krim. We have a, a couple of areas that we're excited to put that capital to work in. Uh, one is great products. We've continued to take great products to market that are designed to help people sleep better, period. Our sheets, our pillows, our mattresses are all designed to help improve the quality of your sleep. And we're gonna continue to take some great products to market. And I would say the next area that we're gonna put that capital to use is taking those products to market through more and more points of distribution. We have 23 stores today. We're gonna be opening up dozens more this year. And we've seen that the stores are a great complement to our online experience, Casper.com, where customers can learn and go into the stores, touch and feel the products, talk to a sleep expert, and really understand the full value proposition of our products, experiences, and brand. Now, it's been reported that Casper hasn't yet reached profitability, though losses are narrowing. Now, brick and retail stores are really expensive. So why expand that footprint, and does it lengthen the time to profitability? You know, when we decide to invest in an area, it really always stems from listening to our customers. We launched the business five years ago and we launched with a mattress. Customers were immediately asking us to design pillows and sheets and all the other products you need to get a great night of sleep. Today, customers are asking us, where can I go to touch and feel the products, lay on your products, understand which one's right for me. And so we're, we're happy to design and, and roll out these stores. But the good news for us is that uh, they're amazingly productive from a, an investment standpoint we're seeing some of the highest retail dollars per square foot out of our store so far we're seeing mid double digit percent comps on stores that have been open for a year and so we're, we're seeing kind of record-breaking uh, investment profiles out of our retail expansion so it, it is actually both accretive to the customer experience as well as to our business model you have plenty of competitors in the online space, Tough to Needle, Lisa Sleep Purple, just to name a few, and they're all slightly different products and different price points, but the idea is the same in terms of cutting out the middlemen, going online direct to consumer. So how does Casper really differentiate itself? So Casper really started this innovation that uh, the traditional mattress buying experience was broken, that it had left the consumer in the wind because the traditional incumbents in the space that are highly consolidated have taken all of the dollars out of the ecosystem. They hadn't invested in innovation, innovation on the product side or innovation on the experience side. What Casper does better than anyone is create best in class products, world class products. Our mattress is the number one rated mattress on Consumer Reports. We're the number one rated, rated brand by Consumer reports we continue to invest in product innovation uh, that is leading the industry and so that's across all of our products we actually have a group in San Francisco called Casper Labs that does all of our own R&D and product innovation none of our competitors startups or incumbents invest like we do to build world-class products and I would say that the next area is that we're trying to design this brand to be end-to-end -end all things sleep for consumers so that's the products that's the experiences that's the distribution strategy we want to be the top of mind brand and I don't think any of our competitors again startups or incumbents think like that have that perspective and really aspire to change the overall wellness equation so that it includes sleep what about the threat from Amazon they recently started selling their own line of mattresses so Amazon has always been a, a large seller of mattresses and we sell our products through Amazon. They've been a great partner for us so far. Uh, we, having them introduce the Amazon basic mattress didn't really change the consumer offering. And what I mean by that is there's always been very low price mattresses in the mattress industry. There's always been the opportunity to buy a two, three, four hundred dollar mattress that really is not designed to last. It's not designed around sleep quality. It's just a, a low end product. And so they didn't change the consumer offering like they did in other categories so for us it's a, a shift in market share at the very bottom end of the the overall industry and we don't really play in that Casper plays in the, the very high end of best in class quality products when it comes to getting a better night of sleep but we do pass on a great value because of our business model 
That was Casper CEO and co-founder Philip Krim speaking with Bloomberg's Selena Wang. Now, grocers in Europe were alarmed by Amazon Go's rapid growth on the continent, so they may fight back with the help of a tiny Portuguese startup. Sensei is pitching its technology to European supermarkets. The goal to beat Amazon in the race to open the region's first checkout list stores. Amazon Go reportedly has looked for a store space in London, but hasn't announced any plans. Still ahead, Snap has announced several new products and services, including a new gaming business. But will they be enough to draw in new users? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. So Snap rallied in trading Friday after the company announced a suite of new products and this included an in-app gaming platform, new original shows, updated augmented reality features and ad network to run ads inside other apps. Shares of the social media company closed at their highest level since August, up 115% year to date. This as the company of course struggles to add customers. Joining us to discuss is Deutsche Bank senior analyst Lloyd Walmsley joining us of course to discuss that you're pretty bullish. Are we now turning a corner on this stock? It feels like we are, yeah. We are starting to warm up to the name. We took our target price up uh, overnight after the going to the Snap Partner Summit. Uh, it really, you're seeing signs that, that the company innovation is live and well. Uh, you're seeing confidence in the management team. And then you're also getting exposed to uh, a rank of executives below the very senior level that for the first time really, and you're seeing the depth of the bench at the company. Interesting. And uh, you know, it does seem like they're getting ready to turn a corner. And so they've moved on from perhaps some of the missteps where we lost executives, particularly the chief strategy officer and the lice that many, many felt have been sort of the adult in the room. Yeah, so last year there was a lot of turnover. We lost uh, Imran Khan, as you noted, um, the CFO left. Uh, they had the disastrous re uh, rollout of a new app version. Yes. Uh, they lost subscribers or, or, or users in the second and third quarter. But it feels like things are a lot more stable uh, at the company at this point, and I think they've put a lot of that behind them. We're not out of the woods yet. I think a lot will come down to the Android uh, rollout of the new app design okay. coming. Okay, how's that um, look? Yeah, so basically they had a lot of problems technologically. Mm. You know, if you look at the company, all the executives there had iPhones yes. and programmed the iPhones. And what they realized as they started to pivot their strategy to try to grow internationally, their product didn't work very well on Android. And mm. so they had to go back to the drawing board and rebuild the product from scratch. And we're just getting some testing out. Uh, the company's releasing, starting to release in the wild this new app. They sound encouraged in the very early findings, but we should get get more color from the company on the next quarter on, on how that's going. From your perspective, how regularly does that happen that people forget about the Android device making and then they put it, many put it second tier, but how f many do they realize that actually don't build the app in the right, correct way to be able to manage it? It's, it's a good question. It's pretty rare. I mean, we have seen instances where companies uh, have flagged in, in documents about kind of lagging in Android, but never certainly have we seen a company take over a year to rebuild an app for Android. So uh, it's very unusual. So that's part of the uncertainty we're faced with now is, is what does it look like as this rolls out. And the other part of the uncertainty that some other analysts have started to voice is how they monetize all these new games, new apps, new, new ways and means to engage the viewer. How do you think that happens? Yeah, it's a good question. So right now with the new games they rolled out yesterday, it's going to be an ad model. And the way they're doing it is if the user wants to click to get an extra life or to extend the game, they have to watch an ad. It's, it's a good ad model because the user is getting something in return for watching an ad. Mm -hmm. So it, it should monetize well. The question in our minds is what kind of adoption do they get? They're making it really easy and very social, so there's some encouraging signs. Uh, but the games look pretty basic, pretty casual. We'll, we'll see. I think uh, in terms of broader monetization on the platform, there's a lot of room for them on just the core advertising. Uh, the pricing is really low compared to some of the other social platforms. And so if they prove that the ads work to advertisers, if they get more advertisers into the system, they can show the right ad to the right user at the right time. 
and revenue should follow. But but we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, they've done a pretty good job, but there's a lot of room left. What are you hearing from marketers? Because it was interesting that we saw a slight spike in Snap's share price when Facebook was having some of its woes. The mean, mm. the view, and maybe boycotts on YouTube sometimes might be advantageous. Is it because they're the only other place to really get access to Gen Z and millennial that they seem to be benefiting? Can they extend that? Yeah, the, what we hear from ad buyers is that they've done a great job attracting the younger audience that is increasingly hard to reach. They don't watch a lot of broadcast TV. Uh, they're hard to find, and so they've done a great job there. Uh, where the you know the company hasn't done as good a job historically is is on the performance marketing side and they've spent the last two years rebuilding their performance marketing capabilities and you know we're starting to hear uh, better things from the ad community uh, one one thing we've consistently heard is that the team at snap building that underlying technology is very talented so encouraging signs but the the one thing we haven't heard yet is advertisers who have been able to really scale their spend mm. and see consistent return on ad spend you know if, if they can do that then there's a lot of room they can get to on monetization but you know we've heard some positive signs but nothing definitive uh, yet how high can the share price go you know when we talk to investors our, our target price right now is 13 um, but when you look at our target multiple, we still use a discount to what other companies in the internet space growing at the same growth rate are trading at. And so you get a little bit of lift in the multiple. And if they can beat on revenue, you could see a nice gain in this air price. You know, it's come back a lot, but uh, there's still some room to go. Lloyd, so glad that we got your opinion. Lloyd Walmsley, Deutsche Bank Senior Analyst on all things Snap. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, we're live streaming on Twitter. Have a very good weekend. This is Bloomberg.